hello there, everyone. This is Nurse Mo, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. This is episode 121, and today we are diving into pharmacology, talking about Fenny Toin, which is an anticonvulsant. And I just want to say I am so thrilled that you are here spending your very precious free time with me today. And I also want to give a quick listener shout out. And sometimes you guys on the podcast reviews, it's your like avatar name. So I'm not really sure how to pronounce this, but it's M.M. Klein, perhaps, or M.M.C. Line. I'm not really sure, but this individual writes, you are amazing. I really enjoy how passionate you are and your intentions for making this podcast. It's very informative and greatly helpful. Thank you so much for taking the time to write a review and submit it on Apple Podcasts. And if you guys want to be featured in my listener shout out, because I do read every single one of your messages, then all you have to do is rate and review this podcast and I will see it. I'll make my husband read it. I'll screenshot it and send it to all of my friends. And I will talk about it here on the podcast as well. Okay, so as promised, today we're diving into a pharmacology topic And this is a drug, phenytoin is a medication that if you are working on a unit that takes care of patients who have a seizure disorder, who've had a stroke or any kind of neurological injury, you're going to be working with anti-seizure medications. And one of those is phenytoin, also known as Dilantin. So this is a medication that is really common on nursing school exams and has been known to show up on the NCLEX. So we're going to dive into phenytoin using the Straight A Nursing Drugs acronym, which is D-R-R-U-G-S, which for me is just a kind of a system systematic way to review the nursing implications for medications so that you don't forget and leave something important out. Okay, so we're just going to dive right into it. For the first letter in this acronym, D, we're talking about what drug class it is. And you guys, the best tip that I can give you for pharmacology, because you guys ask all the time. How do I study for pharmacology? How do I learn all these drugs? Learn the drug classes. And once you know the drug classes and which meds fall into those classes, you might not know every single detail about every single drug in that class, but you will know probably 75 to 80% of what you need to know. That's a huge... um, That's just a huge amount of learning that you can get simply by learning the drug class. Of course, within the drug class, individual drugs, there'll be little differences here and there. But for the most part, if you guys know your classes and which drugs are in them, you're going to know so, so much. So the drug class for phenytoin is an anticonvulsant. That's the therapeutic drug class. And you guys will see therapeutic classes and pharmacologic classes. So the therapeutic drug class for phenytoin is anticonvulsant, also antiarrhythmic, which that could be surprising to see a medication that you might initially think of as only used to treat seizures being used for a patient who doesn't have any kind of neurological history. It could be because that patient is getting it for its antiarrhythmic properties. It's used to shorten the action potential and decrease automaticity. But today we're talking about it um, based on its neurological effects. So therapeutically an anticonvulsant and then pharmacologically it's in a class called the hydantoins and hydantoins are typically used to treat partial and tonic clonic seizures so if you'd like to review seizure disorders i have a blog post all about that and a podcast episode as well and i will link to both of those in the show notes So hydantoins, so it's the pharmacologic class, these drugs delay the influx of sodium across neuronal membranes. And by doing so, it dampens central nervous system activity. 
So recall that sodium is that main factor in the initiation of a neuronal action potential. So your your physiology is coming back to haunt you, right? So with less sodium moving across that membrane, we have suppression of neuronal activity. It's important, though, to understand that we're not suppressing it or or blocking it completely because that would cause um, all neuronal activity to cease, such as what happens with local anesthetics. We're just making them less sensitive so that neuronal activity isn't as high and isn't high enough for seizure activity to occur. So the first hydantoin produced is phenytoin or dilantin, which is the brand name, and that's been in use since 19. 1930, you guys. It's considered a broad spectrum medication, meaning it treats most types of epilepsy except for absence seizures. One of the benefits of this drug class is that hydantoins, like phenytoin, suppress that seizure activity without suppressing or depressing the whole central nervous system. Okay, so that's the drug class. Therapeutically, anticonvulsant, okay? All you need to know about that basically is the action the hat that the medication have. What goal is it going to have? It's going to be, uh, you know, anticonvulsant. It's going to be no seizure activity or hopefully less seizure activity at least. And then the pharmacologic class is the hydantoins. And what you need to know about those is that they have to do with the sodium influx across the neuronal membranes, dampening CNS activity. And then the first R in the drugs acronym is for routes. And the reason I have this in here is because a lot of medications are available in different routes and you need to be aware of this. So phenytoin is either given as an IV medication, can also be given as a PO medication. So giving it IV or giving it by mouth. And then the second R in the drugs acronym is regular dose range. So the reason I want you guys to know this, and it may seem like a lot of information to keep track of when you're looking at dose ranges, I'm not saying memorize the heck out of it, but have a general idea. The reason I say this is because You just want to have a general idea so that if you get an exam question that has an order for 100 milligrams of fentanyl, you know that that's way off base because you know the regular dose range for fentanyl is in micrograms. Okay, so that's kind of that level of general awareness that I'm talking about. In the case of phenytoin, it's going to be dosed a lot of times with a loading dose and a maintenance dose. So if you've not ever heard of this term loading dose before, a loading dose is used when it's necessary to get the patient's serum levels of a drug up to those therapeutic levels very quickly. So we load them up. So in the case of phenytoin, it's 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram, not to exceed an infusion of 25 to 50 milligrams per minute. So the maintenance dose, on the other hand, is quite a bit less at 5 to 6 milligrams per kilogram per day, given in 1 to 3 divided doses. So I'm going to say that again because I know it's a lot of numbers to throw at you. The loading dose for IV phenytoin is in an adult 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram. And we're going to give that at a rate not to exceed 25 to 50 milligrams per minute. This would be an excellent, excellent dosage calculations question, you guys. Um, And if you are thinking the same thing I'm thinking, like that might be kind of a tricky dosage calculations question to have, I'm going to... um, walk you through that a little bit at the end of the episode, maybe so you can pause the podcast and get to a place where you can jot through a dosage calculations question. um, And we'll work through one together. So that loading dose 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram, not to exceed a rate of administration of 25 to 50 milligrams per minute. 
And then the maintenance dose, quite a bit less, 5 to 6 milligrams per kilogram. And that's even broken down further by giving it in divided doses. Maybe one dose, but a lot of times two or three divided doses. Now, that's IV. For the PO route, the adult dose range for the loading dose luckily is the same. It's 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram. The difference, though, in that PO is that that loading dose is given in three divided doses every two to four hours. So we're still loading them up. We're still giving it um, in a short-ish time interval, but we're not giving it IV all at once. And then the maintenance PO dose is also the same as the IV dose, 5 to 6 milligrams per kilogram per day in 1 to 3 divided doses. So that's nice about phenytoin, right? The milligrams are the same whether it's IV or PO. That is not always the case. So again, phenytoin, great example of a dosage calculation question that is dosed by weight. So um, if you're at your desk, stay there. We're going to get pen and paper out. And we'll do a calculation together at the end of this episode. If you're driving, walking, washing the dog, folding laundry, you can come back to this later and we'll do it together at the end. So the U in the drugs acronym is for uses. So um, a lot of times medications will have lots of different uses and we did talk about this in the drug class component, but it's, I've listed it here just to make sure that you understand why your patient is taking the medication. So we know that the drug class, the therapeutic class, is that it could be an anticonvulsant or an antiarrhythmic, and that's fine and good. You want to know that. When we get to uses, I want you to know why your patient is taking this medication. And this is just because a lot of drugs will have multiple uses. Sometimes they'll have an off-label use. So you'll see your patient taking a medication for a condition that has nothing to do with the condition that they actually have. So you need to understand why your patient is taking it, okay? So in our patient's case, he's taking the medication to prevent seizure activity, okay? A great example of this is patients with polycythemia, polycythemia vera, taking a medication whose uh, intended use is for hepatitis. So if you get a patient and they're taking this medication, which is called pegylated interferon alpha-2A, and you have that and you look it up and you're like, wait a minute, my patient does not have a hepatitis. I don't understand what's going on. That's because your patient is using it for the bone marrow suppression that the medication causes as a side effect. It's actually a therapeutic benefit for patients with polycythemia. So now you know why understanding the use of a med is really important because Sometimes it's being used for something completely different and off-label use, okay? And then the G in guidelines for giving IV phenytoin, okay, remember, we're not going to give it faster than, what was that rate that we talked about in the very beginning? Excellent, yes. Not to exceed 25 to 50 milligrams per minute, okay? So again, if you're concerned about your calculations, stick around at the very end and we'll do one together. So some other guidelines are to know that this medication will interact adversely with a lot of other medications. And I don't need you to memorize what all of those are. Just know that it has a lot of other medication interactions and will interact negatively with alcohol. And these interactions can cause the patient to have an elevated serum level of phenytoin. There are some medications that will cause the patient to have a decreased level, level of serum phenytoin. The main point with this one is to know that there's a lot of drug interactions and you would want to definitely know all the medications that your patient is taking and probably they are going to be advised by their doctor and pharmacist to not drink alcohol while taking this medication. Phenytoin itself can also decrease the effectiveness of many other drugs, including amiodarone, including warfarin, and oral contraceptives. And to me, that's an excellent test question. I would definitely put that on an exam. It can also decrease the absorption of folic 
acid. And if given concurrently in the PO version, if given concurrently with enteral feeding, may decrease the absorption of the phenytoin as well. So if you've got a patient on tube feedings, enteral feedings, and their continuous feedings, you would probably want to talk with the pharmacist or the MD about pausing the tube feeding um, for a certain amount of time before and after the phenytoin is given. If they're getting enteral feedings as bolus feedings, then you would want to make sure that the phenytoin is not given with their feeding, that it's given when their stomach is empty because that enteral feeding can decrease its absorption. A very key point to know about phenytoin is that it has what's called a narrow therapeutic window. And what this means is that there's a very small range where phenytoin is effective. If the serum levels in the patient's blood are too low, the patient may still have seizures. If the serum level in the patient's blood is too high, then the medication becomes toxic. So patients taking phenytoin will need regular and close monitoring of their serum phenytoin levels. Some signs of phenytoin toxicity are mainly neurologic in nature, which makes sense, right? Because this drug is used to treat a neurological condition. A lot of the toxicity symptoms are neurological in nature. And those are ataxia, confusion, the patient could have slurred speech, nystagmus, they could be nauseous and confused. It's also very toxic to the tissues, that IV phenytoin. So you definitely want to keep a close eye on your IV sites and make sure that your IV is nice and patent. If you had any extravasation, that would probably be pretty bad for your patient. It can cause some really serious skin issues. So keep a close eye on your IV sites. IV phenytoin has a slight yellow color to it, so this is normal. It doesn't mean the solution is bad. And if you pull phenytoin from the refrigerator, you might look at it and notice that there could be some pre precipitate in that, in that solution. This precipitate should go away once the medication reaches room temperature. So you definitely don't want to give the medication while there's precipitate in it. Wait until it reaches room temperature and the solution becomes clear. You want to teach the patient to avoid drinking alcohol, again, while taking this medication. And here's another key point, you guys, if you're multitasking, come back. A key point is that you will teach the patient the vital, vital importance of good dental hygiene and regular dental cleanings. And we'll talk about why this is important in just a bit when we get into the side effects. And another drug interaction would be that antacids, if taken within three hours of the phenytoin, can decrease the absorption of PO phenytoin. Okay, so you just want to space those things out. And then the last letter in the acronym of drugs is side effects. So like any medication that affects the central nervous system, phenytoin has a lot of neurological side effects. So that doesn't mean it only has neurological side effects. You'll see that some of the side effects that it has are not neurological in nature. So let's just go through what some of these are. So the very most important one that you'll be asked about on exams without a doubt, and I can guarantee this, is it will talk about gingival hyperplasia. So this will be an exam question. If it's not, I will send you um, a coffee <laughs> because I'm just so sure that it is. Okay, you guys, gingival hyperplasia is an overgrowth of the gums, which leads to gum disease and tooth loss. So if you guys are asked a question on an exam about phenytoin side effects, I guarantee you at some point, it's going to be about gingival hyperplasia. It can also cause nausea. It can cause hypertrichosis, which is excessive hair growth can cause rashes, hypotension, and um, some life-threatening things that it can cause are aplastic anemia, a granulocytosis, and Stevens-Johnson syndrome. But I guarantee you, if you're going to be asked only one thing about 
phenytoin, it's going to be about that gingival hyperplasia and the tooth loss, okay? Um, there you have it, you guys. That is your brief overview of the must-know information about phenytoin. It is a very commonly prescribed medication to prevent seizures. And now if you are able to sit at your desk and you want to talk about these dosage calculations questions that we're going to go through, this is the time to do that. So let's get our pens, let's get our calculators and our paper together. Okay, so the MD has ordered a loading dose of phenytoin PO for your patient who's been having seizures. The dose is 15 milligrams per kilogram, and phenytoin comes in an oral suspension of 125 milligrams per 5 mils. Your patient weighs 105 pounds. How many mils will she take with each dose? So I'm going to say that again so that you don't have to panic. The MD has ordered a loading dose of phenytoin PO for your patient who has been having seizures. The dose is 15 milligrams per kilogram. 15 milligrams per kilogram. And phenytoin comes in an oral suspension of 125 milligrams per five mils. Okay, that's 125 milligrams per five mils. And your patient weighs 105 pounds. How many mils will she take with this loading dose? So pause here and then we'll talk through the solution together. So to set this one up, you guys, you always want to start with what you know, with what the order is, right? So that very first equation should be 15 milligrams over kilogram. Okay, because that's what we're figuring out for. The order is for the patient to get 15 milligrams of medication per every kilogram. And then the next thing that I like to do is I'm either going to address the milligrams or the kilograms. I'm going to address something in that first part. So let's get the kilograms out of the way first. So we know that one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. So does kilograms go on the top or the bottom of this equation? Well, we know we want kilograms to cancel out. So we're going to put kilogram on the top because it's on the bottom in that previous fraction, right? So by putting it on the top, those units will cancel out. So it's one kilogram over 2.2 pounds. And then, well, now I have my pounds. I know that I don't want to end up with pounds in my answer, so we're going to get rid of it. So what do we know about the pounds? We know what the patient weighs in pounds, and it's 105 pounds. So is that going to go on the top of this next equation or fraction or on the bottom? So it's going to go on the top, very good, because in the previous fraction, it was on the bottom. We had one kilogram over 2.2 pounds. So now it's going on the top, 105 pounds over one patient. So our pounds cancel out. And then we have our medication, the concentration that it comes in. So we're going to put 125 milligrams and 5 mils. The question is, does it go um, with 5 mils on top or 125 milligrams on top? So go back and look at the very first fraction that you wrote, 15 milligrams over kilogram. Well, milligrams is on the top there. We know we want it to cancel out because we're looking for an answer in mils. So milligrams is on the top in that first fraction, it needs to be on the bottom in this fraction. So the fraction is set up 5 mils over 125 milligrams. And then you go through and you cancel out all of those units. So milligrams cancel out, kilograms cancel, pounds cancel, and the only thing you're left with is mils and patient. And look at that. That's exactly what we're trying to figure out. How many mils will this patient get? So you multiply across the top, divide across the bottom, and you get 28.6 mils. Let's round that up for ease of administration, 29 mils. Okay, very good job. And the first thing I hope you thought when you got that answer was, whoa, that's a lot of oral elixir to drink. And I want to give you a gold star for thinking that. And I hope that you maybe even double checked your math, even though it is the right answer answer anytime you're opening multiple vials, multiple containers of any medication, always, always, always double check your math because there 
are a ton of instances where you do need to open multiple, multiple vials, like maybe two. But if you're opening, you know, five or six vials or containers, you might want to ask yourself, let me check and make sure this is right. And the reason this is right, remember, is that the loading dose is quite quite a bit higher than the maintenance dose. So in this case, 29 mils is absolutely correct. It will be our loading dose for this medication given at 15 milligrams per kilogram. Let's do one more dosage calculations question together, you guys. So you're giving IV phenytoin, and the patient is getting a loading dose of 15 milligrams per kilogram. He weighs 123 pounds, and the medication comes in a concentration of 50 milligrams per mil. How many minutes will you take to infuse this medication if the rate of infusion is 25 milligrams per minute, rounded to the nearest whole number? So I'm going to go back and read that again. Your patient is getting a loading dose of IV phenytoin, at a dose of 15 milligrams per kilogram. He weighs 123 pounds. The medication comes in a concentration of 50 milligrams per mil. How many minutes will it take for you to infuse this medication if the rate of infusion is 25 milligrams per minute? And then you'll round that to the nearest whole number. So take a moment, see if you can figure that one out, pause the podcast, and then we'll come back and we'll look at this one together. Okay, are you guys ready? So the answer to this one is 34 minutes. And there's a really good chance that this one was tricky for you guys. And that's okay. I did that on purpose. So let's talk through the concept behind setting this one up and how we set it up. So when we look at a question like this, you might be so, so, so tempted to use that conversion factor of what the medication comes in, in what format. So what was it? It was 50 milligrams per mil. And if you tried six ways from Sunday to work that equation or that conversion factor into your calculation, you probably struggled a lot. And the reason that you probably struggled is that you don't need this information. The only time you would need to use the 50 milligrams per mil is to determine how much volume that you're giving. You're not looking at the volume at all. You're not looking at how many mils you're giving per minute. If we were, then we would use that number. We're simply looking at how many milligrams we are giving per minute and how long it will take for us to infuse that milligrams per minute. So in this question, you're going to start by looking at the order. So let's look at that, which was 15 milligrams over kilogram. Okay, we know that that was in the order. That part is easy. And just like in the last question, let's get rid of the kilograms and get that converted to pounds. So we have kilograms on the bottom in that first fraction. So we know that kilograms is going to go on the top in the second one. So we put one kilogram over 2.2 pounds. And then to get rid of pounds, we put the patient's weight, 123 pounds. And because pounds was in the bottom of that previous fraction, we're putting it on the top of this one. So it's 123 pounds over one patient. And now we're looking at our milligrams. And we know we're not going to exceed 25 milligrams per minute. So let's put 25 milligrams on the bottom and then minute on the top. And if we multiply across the top and we divide across the bottom, we get 34 minutes. So if you had trouble with these, I don't want you to stress out, you guys. I have a step-by-step -step dosage calculations course where I walk you through all kinds of dosage calculations, even tricky ones where, you know, they're really convoluted or they try to confuse you, they try to trip you up. I go through it step-by-step, -step, starting with the basics and working your way up to the more advanced 
calculations. And I will put a link to that in the show notes as well. Um, The main piece of advice that I would give about dosage calculations questions is that if you look at these as math problems, you're going to struggle. If you look at them as math problems, you're probably trying to put all the data into the equation somewhere and cram them in together and make them fit and make them work. And the reality is these are not math problems. These are concepts. These are moments in time. These are puzzles that you need to figure out. So knowing which information you need to solve the problem to get to the right answer is half the battle. So we talk about that in the course as well. And just as you're practicing, I want you to really think about conceptually what is the question asking. Do you need the volume? Do you need the dose? What information do you need in order to get to the answer? And the more you do and the more you practice, the better you will get at it. Okay, let's do a few pod quiz questions so that you guys can really solidify these concepts. So we'll do a few of these. So tell me what the two therapeutic drug classes for phenytoin are. Excellent. Anticonvulsant and antiarrhythmic. So just for your understanding to see if you were paying attention, why is it often used as an antiarrhythmic? Well, maybe not often, but what would be, um, what does it do in the heart to make it an antiarrhythmic? Yes, it's going to shorten that action potential and decrease automaticity. Excellent work. And then let's look at its pharmacologic class. Do you remember the name of that pharmacologic class? Excellent. Hydantoins. Very good, you guys. And what do hydantoins do um, in relation to the neuronal membranes? They delay that influx of sodium across the membranes. Very good. And what does that do to CNS activity? It dampens it. Very, very good. So what is the brand name for phenytoin? It is Dilantin. Excellent job, you guys. And what are the two routes that we can use phenytoin in? Routes of administration. We have IV route and we have PO route. So let's talk a little bit about the dosing. What is the loading dose, the IV loading dose for an adult for phenytoin? Excellent. It is 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram. Good job. And we're going to give that at a rate not to exceed what? Awesome. Not to exceed 25 to 50 milligrams per minute. And then how about the maintenance IV dose? Do you remember that one? The maintenance IV dose is 5 to 6 milligrams per kilogram in 1 to 3 divided doses. Very good, you guys. Okay, what is the PO loading dose for an adult? Just the dose part. Good, 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram. And then how are we going to administer that? It's in three divided doses given how far apart? Every two to four hours. Very good. And then what's the maintenance PO dose? Awesome. It's five to six milligrams per kilogram, exactly the same as the IV. And that's given per day in how many divided doses? One to three divided doses. Very, very good. Okay, so some of the guidelines about giving phenytoin. um, You definitely want to teach the patient to avoid doing what? Drinking alcohol. And what what is that going to do to the phenytoin levels? It can cause elevated phenytoin levels. And why do we care? We care because phenytoin has a narrow therapeutic window. It can be either not effective or it can be toxic. And it has a very little tiny window where it's actually effective and not toxic. So tell me some of the signs of phenytoin toxicity. Okay, super good, you guys. So ataxia, confusion, slurred speech, nystagmus, nausea, confusion, those types of things. And what are you going to be aware of if you pull phenytoin out of the refrigerator? 
Awesome. Yeah, it could have some precipitate and you want to just let that come to room temperature and that precipitate should go away. You definitely don't want to give anything with precipitate in it. And then what is the side effect that I predict will be on your exam questions? Gingival hyperplasia. And we care about that because... Yeah, it causes um, gum disease, it causes tooth loss, and it sets the patient up for just that inflammation and infection with the gum disease. And then your patient's also taking an antacid. How are you going to coordinate that with the administration of pheophenitoin? You're going to have about a three-hour window between the antacid and the phenytoin. Very, very good. And okay, I think you guys are phenytoin experts now. So I hope that that helps you guys understand Finitoin, gave you a little practice with dosage calculations questions. And next week, I hope that you come back and join me. What will we be talking about next week? Oh, we're going to be diving back into OB, which we haven't talked about in a while. And we're going to be looking at the high risk teen pregnancy. So um, just because of um, body physiology and some other things, all teens are considered high risk, especially those young teens who might be very young, very small in stature. So we're looking at that young 13, 14, 15 year old teen in the next episode of high risk pregnancy. So I'll see you back here next week, you guys. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing. 